Hello, I'm Kelly McFarland, and this is Headlines in History from the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, where we digest the most important updates from the world of diplomacy and foreign policy and take a short dive into one of the most pressing issues of the day. Today, we're taking a deep look at the ongoing crisis in Haiti and the prospect of a UN-backed Kenyan-led police mission with Jacqueline Charles, the Haiti and Caribbean correspondent at the Miami Herald. But before we get into that, let's take a look at some of the biggest foreign policy trends that have been going on in the past few weeks. My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. I also believe that events in Iraq have reminded America of the need to use diplomacy. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. All right, Freddie, how are things going? Good, Kelly. How are you doing? Not too bad. Um, just had a lovely weekend back in the great state of Ohio visiting family. And the kids got to see grandma and grandpa and their uncle and everything. So so things are good. I had to watch Scotland lose to England at rugby the same weekend that I'm working on a case study about Scottish independence that we'll be publishing in the next uh, next couple of weeks. So it was, a, it was a weekend of heavy irony for me. Yeah, it all comes together. It all comes together. Yeah. So today on the docket, we're going to get into the EU's recently passed Net Zero Industry Act. And we're going to have an update on the Russian mystery weapon that raised alarm bells in Washington a few weeks ago. Then finally, we'll turn to our conversation with Jacqueline Charles of the Miami Herald on the crisis in Haiti amid a court ruling on who was culpable in the murder of the country's former president. So we'll start off with the EU's Net Zero Industry Act. So in the beginning of February, the European Union passes what it dubs the Net Zero Industry Act, which promises to boost green manufacturing on the continent as countries move to curtail greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The law is, in effect, a response to the US Inflation Reduction Act passed in August of 2022. The American law, of course, implemented numerous subsidies and incentives to get companies to boost clean energy production in the United States which was all done to the great displeasure of Europe, which complained quite loudly at the time that the Biden administration and US policymakers were engaging in a form of green protectionism. Kelly, it seems that Europe has jumped into a wave of industrial policy moves that have been proliferating quite a lot since the end of the pandemic, and to a certain extent since the Trump administration took office. What does Europe hope to do with this new law and what effects might it have on trade and investment? So as you noted, a lot of this recent European action is in response to the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA. Um, you know, that, like you mentioned, had a lot of subsidies to U.S. companies and the Europeans really sort of were upset with this over what they viewed as unfair practices by the United States and the, the subsidies going to American companies and how it made it more difficult for Europeans to get their products into the U.S. market. So this is in part a response to that. Now, it doesn't have as much money in subsidies as the IRA does in the United States, which has about $369 billion with a B. So what this new act does for the Europeans is that it's meant to strengthen their manufacturing capacity of net zero technologies. And in the EU, as well as in America, there's also a lot of regulations and sort of red tape that make it very difficult to start up new things and uh, whether it be manufacturing or mining or different different aspects of just you know starting new businesses and infrastructure projects and that sort of thing so this also tries to overcome some of those barriers to scaling up manufacturing capacity in Europe and they're doing this all in light of pushing for reducing their net greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030 and also, they have this new plan in place to try to wean the continent off of what they call adversarial energy, which basically means, you know, before the Ukraine war, they were getting most of their gas and energy from Russia, and they're trying to move towards something that isn't getting gas and energy from a potential hostile power. We'll see what happens with this. They're trying to just increase their own demand for clean tech by, again, trying to speed up these permitting procedures and things like this. They're going to create a European hydrogen bank. And another important aspect to watch in light of this as well is that the EU is currently in trade talks, which have been going on for some time now with the US over European access to electric vehicle supply chain subsidies. The, these were included in the IRA. The European Union wants to be able to have some of these electric vehicle parts made partially in the EU. Um, and they want some of those to qualify for the IRA subsidies. The U.S. has already agreed to something similar to this with Japan, and now the EU and the U.S. are trying to do something similar. So that's sort of the next big step in this to watch moving forward. 
So our second story is going to be on the Russian so-called mystery weapon. Uh, earlier this month, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Representative Mike Turner of Ohio, raised quite a lot of alarm bells across Washington when the committee released quite a cryptic public statement saying it had made available to all members of Congress information concerning a serious national security threat. It didn't go into any detail, but it called quite directly on the Biden administration to declassify the information and inform the public. In the next couple of days, the Pentagon revealed that it was a plan by Russia to put an anti-satellite nuclear weapon in space. So the reports say that the US has warned its allies that Russia could develop and deploy something as soon as this year or next. Although, of course, the Kremlin denies the existence of such a weapon. So Kelly, you were in the Intel world for quite a few years before you came to Georgetown. What kind of development is this? Is it a seismic as we were sort of led to believe by those members of Congress? So there's a couple aspects to this story. And the first part of this is the political side of it. And, you know, you hear the news about this, about the potential of Russia putting a space-based nuclear weapon into orbit. And, you know, this is something that goes against the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, you know, just to start. This is a capability that has been, you know, discussed and sort of worried about in national security government circles for, you know, at least a decade, if not probably longer, because of the fact that if you think about the ways that the United States undertakes its military activities, especially against like a peer power, right? You think back to the Persian Gulf War and the precision bombs and watching the videos of the bombs exploding for the first time, seeing that on television and everything. And, you know, what drives that, right? It's GPS, global positioning satellites. And, one of the things that you fear if you're the United States from you know the national security professionals, the military, is that in a serious confrontation with somebody like a Russia or a China, one of the first things they would try to do is to take out our satellites so that our very smart military becomes very dumb very fast. And you lose the ability to communicate, you lose the ability to have your smart weapons, your GPS guided weapons and things like that. There's still other weapons you can use that are, you know, quote unquote smart, but it just makes everything a whole heck of a lot more difficult, especially when you're used to using those things. And now you've kind of go, got to go back to a military from like the 1980s or 70s and sort of what you can do from a communications and GPS standpoint. So that has always been a major issue. Now, what this purported weapon does is that, again, it's not a threat to humans on earth as in in the way that like they're going to shoot a nuke from outer space into Washington DC this is meant to be a weapon in space to take out other satellites and you know there's worrisome issues on that because of the military aspect that i just spoke about but also if you blow up stuff in space you create tons and tons of space junk for those of you who haven't seen the movie Gravity from about a decade ago uh, with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock, just go watch the first 10 minutes of that and you'll understand what a big deal space junk is. Basically, spoiler alert, you've got a lot of stuff flying around really quickly that's just floating around out there and can like sort of destroy other things that are up there. So you don't want a lot of debris floating around in near Earth orbit where most of the satellites are. So, you know, that's the other troublesome thing about it. I also think that, you know, this is, like I said, something that's been discussed for quite a while now in Washington and national security and military circles. There's arguments out there that Rogers did this for maybe a couple political reasons. First being that he's sort of a pro-Ukraine aid guy in the House, Republican in the House, that people are saying he was doing this again to sort of demonstrate the threat of Russia and the fact that we need to, you know, fund Ukraine sort of doing that through the through the side door, so to speak. And the other reason being that there's some discussion out there that this part of the way they were able to get this information was through the, the 702 foreign surveillance law that's up for debate and needs to be reenacted in Congress now so that we still have that capability. And he's a large proponent of that. So this might have also been a sort of a ploy on his part to demonstrate, like, see, if we don't have 702, we wouldn't have gotten this information kind of thing. So from an Intel standpoint, you never like to see, you know, stuff put on the front page of the New York Times and all over the news when it's still classified and it hasn't, you know, gone through a 
broader discussion in the interagency that, oh, we can declassify this or we should declassify this and here's why. And there's, you know, strategic reasons to do that, like we saw at the beginning of the Ukraine war and what the Biden administration released about Russian intentions and, and that kind of stuff. But so I think there's, you know, probably quite a few people in the intelligence community that were upset that he did that. Yeah. But I think at, at this point, the relevant folks on the Hill have been briefed. And I think moving forward, we need to watch and keep an eye on whether or not the Russians are going to put something like this in space so that we can sort of take this to the relevant international bodies and, and push back against this type of action. But it was an interesting moment in the uh, intelligence world. So that ends our news roundup. And we now move to our conversation on Haiti, including recent developments with a court indictment over the assassination of the country's former president with Jacqueline Charles. Jacqueline is the Haiti and Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald, where she has been covering the region for over a decade. She has won numerous awards for her reporting and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for her coverage of the aftermath of the devastating 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Let's listen in to the conversation. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into the current issues that are going on in Haiti right now, can you give us a little bit of history to Haiti itself. You've been covering Haiti and the Caribbean for a long time. For those of our listeners who are a little bit less familiar with the region, can you give us a little bit of Haiti's history and politics uh, well before the current political crisis? Sure. So first of all, we should say that you know Haiti is located in the Caribbean on the island of Hispaniola, and it shares that island with the Dominican Republic. Um, Haiti itself, you know, was a French colony, but not just a French colony. It was France's richest colony. What we've seen is a country whose beginnings started off rebellious, started with international meddling, it started with violence. Um, This was the world's first Black Republic. It was declared free and independent on the 1st of January, 1804, after enslaved Africans, you know, successfully rose in rebellion um, against French colonizers. But at the same time, you know, in 1825, France demanded a ransom of 150 million gold francs, which was later reduced to about 90 million. But that was the price that Haiti had to pay for its freedom. And it paid that money well <laughs> into the 1900s. And so that has always been a reference point in terms of talking about, you know, why do we see a country today that is basically poverty stricken, um, that was once wealthy, you know, what happened to all of these riches? And, you know, it's a complex history. And today you have a country that is 30 plus years post dictatorship, and it is still struggling with democracy. And I have to tell you that, you know, a lot of the Haitians, you know, you're talking about a country of almost 12 million people, A lot of them don't really believe in democracy because there's a whole generation that they've known nothing but political instability in this period of quote unquote democracy. So, you know, when we look at what's happening in the country today, I think we have to take all of that into consideration a country post colonization and a country post dictatorship that is still, you know, where you've only had democracy for about 30 some years, one generation, but it has been anything but a smooth ride. Yeah. And as a diplomatic historian, I'm very grateful that you went all the way back to the 18th century. So I appreciate that. You noted that it's, you know, 30 years post dictatorship in Haiti and the U.S. actually sent forces there in the 1990s. You know, even post dictatorship, like you said, this the, the democracy aspect hasn't been the best for Haitians. But recently, Haiti was in a bad spot even before the current political and security crisis. President Jovenel Moise was looking to stay in power. A hurricane had just racked the island and violence was on the rise amid widespread social unrest. And then he got assassinated. So how did things unfold leading up to the president's assassination? Well, we have to remember in 2010, uh, we had an earthquake, uh, a devastating earthquake, 7.0 or above. And most of Port-au-Prince was basically destroyed. Um, prior to that earthquake on January 12, 2010, I can tell you that things were picking up. Haitians who 
for so long were not certain about the future, putting their money in U.S. banks or elsewhere, they were starting to invest in the country. Of course, around this time, you had a U.N. peacekeeping force that was in the country. The president was Rene Preval, not somebody who was very exciting, but somebody who really pushed the whole notion of stability. On January 12, 2010, an earthquake struck. And what you saw there was the international community responding and saying, okay, we've, we've, we've got to respond. We have to do some things. And, you know, there was a real push to have Preval have elections in the midst of all of that chaos, in the midst of all of that rubble. And I remember the diplomatic shuffle that was going back and forth to really push this to have an election. You know, so you had an election during a very tumultuous time in this country you had an international community that made a lot of promises that eventually were not fulfilled. And you had Michelle Martelly, who's a, he's a singer, very well known. So he eventually came into power after a very controversial vote. But at the end of his term, he was not able to have this democratic transfer of power. So the country went into a transition, another transition. And then eventually you had Jovenel Moise, who was the handpicked uh, successor of Michel Martelly. And so that election, though, had also been hit by fraud, massive fraud allegations. It was delayed for over a year. And so there was always this question about when does Jovenel Moise's presidential term actually end? The presidential term in Haiti is five years. But the Constitution there's different language about when does that clock really start? Does it start on the day that you take office or does it start on the, the last day that the last president leaves office? And you had an opposition, their response was to go into the streets and to just march. So you had four years of a president that was just, you know, the target of anti-government protests continuous throughout his term. And we started to see an expansion of the gang. In the last year that Jovenel Moise was in office, he was actually ruling by decree because he had dismissed parliament saying that your term is over. He had not held any elections during his time in office. And so he was being accused of trying to become the region's next dictator because he was basically passing laws by executive order. He wanted to rewrite the constitution um, and to do this unilaterally, his own political party did not agree with him on this. And then on the 7th of February, 2021, when a lot of his detractors and legal scholars were saying that his presidential mandate ended, he announced that he had been the target of an assassination attempt um, in a coup d'etat. Uh, 22 people were arrested in the middle of the night in violation of the law. Um, but everybody thought those who believed that it was such an attempt were like, okay, this is over. This is fine. July 7th, 2021 happens. The president is assassinated in his private residence in the middle of the night. His wife is wounded. And basically you see a huge political vacuum that happened. I mean, imagine a country where all the elected officials, their mandates are over. There are only 10 elected officials in the country, which are 10 senators out of 30. The lower house already disbanded. The head of the Supreme Court had died of COVID. And then you had a power struggle on the part of the outgoing prime minister who was there under President Jovenel Moise. The new one, Ariel Henry, whom he had picked before he was killed, but he did not get a chance to swear in. So, you know, it, it was just a perfect storm of just this just complete void. When you think about who's in charge, who should be in charge, who's calling the shots, and, and, and how do you get things moving? So in light of this perfect storm, you then have the gangs come in and fill the void. So what is the violence like today in Haiti and the economy because of that, and basically just how are normal people trying to get by in Haiti? So we should also note that five weeks after President Jovenel Moïse's assassination, the country was hit by another earthquake. But that just sort of added on to the challenges that Haiti was already undergoing. I think one of the things that people 
whether they follow Haiti closely or they don't, but often gets overlooked is that this is a country that was already on a downward spiral, even under an elected president. The economy was shot. Inflation was double digit. You had civil servants who were going months, if not years, not being able to get paid because the government was robbing Peter to pay Paul. You also had an international community that was holding you know, millions of dollars in aid, but they had not released that because of concerns about corruption in the government and where this money was going to go and whether or not it was actually going to meet the people. So you bring all of this forward and you add on to this now, an assassinated president, all of these questions about what happened you know, a police force that is falling apart at the seams and you have gangs and you have these gangs that are in these communities that have felt, you know, we've been overlooked. You know, a lot of these are young men. Um, The population of Haiti is very young and they haven't really seen a, a future and they got access to guns and bullets, even though there is a U.S. arms embargo um, on the country, which means that even the Haitian police cannot really get access to weapons without getting it checked off by Washington. And so what you're starting to see this explosion of, of, of this violence. You have a police force that, you know, for 12 million people today, it's estimated that it's probably less than 6,000. So, you know, how do you address the security situation when you don't have the equipment, you don't have the manpower, woman power, um, all of these challenges? And on top of it, you mentioned the economy. You know, the economy has been in this downward spiral. You know, all of this is just added on to, you know, the crisis that we see today where hunger is deepening. Um, there's a socio-political crisis that is deepening, a humanitarian crisis overall, um, and at the same time, you have people who are who are fleeing. They either are leaving the capital or they're leaving the country altogether. Yeah, and you know, following up on the assassination of Moïse, there was an indictment released on February 20th that pointed the finger for the assassination at a number of the former president's inner circle, most notably his widow. Uh, who you mentioned was actually shot in the assassination, the country's then prime minister and a former chief of national police. Can you walk us through that indictment and sort of what initial thoughts have been on that over the since it was released about you know a little over a week ago? So this assassination spurred three different investigations. We had an investigation by um, the authorities in Colombia because the individuals who were hired as quote unquote bodyguards and who were accused of being assassins or mercenaries or former Colombian military soldiers. Then you had the investigation that was launched by the US. The FBI went down there because a number of the suspects are um, US citizens. Part of this plot was cooked in Miami, in the Miami area. There are two security firms that are in the Miami area that have also been cited in this. They're the ones who hired and recruited these Colombian soldiers. And then you have the Haiti investigation. And there have been five investigative judges that were assigned. And in the Haitian system, an investigative judge works very much like a U.S. grand jury. And in this particular case, this last judge, who was the fifth judge, the one who had the the dossier for the longest, and he spent about 14 months, he basically came up with his indictment. And one of the things that he, the points that he make is that President Trump should have been the most protected individual in the country. You know, his security was supposed to be secured by three elite units of the Haitian National Police. And instead, you know, he was shot a dozen times, you know, in his room. And based on the testimonies by individuals that he's interrogated over that time, what he saw was one, he's naming at least two intellectual authors, which is Christian Emmanuel Sanon, who's a pastor, he's Haitian American, and he was basically promoting himself both in Miami and in Haiti as the choice to replace um, Jovenel Moise to lead a transition. And he was claiming that he had U.S. government support, which he did not. 
you know, he's the guy through him, these Colombians were hired and this whole idea that he's going to be the transition. So they see him as sort of opening the pathway for this to, to happen. And then there's another individual, former government consultant, Joseph Felix Baggio, who had basically been on the run for almost two years. And he basically served as a key government um, witness in the sense that he is a key suspect, but he also had provided a lot of information um, when he spoke to both police and to the judge. And his claim is that, look, you know, a lot of people knew that there was something cooking, that there was a coup. Maybe they were not the one to pull the trigger. Maybe they were not um, part of the decision to take this from um, a kidnapping or arrest of the president using some bogus warrant to actual his assassination. But the claim by Baggio is that inside the National Palace, that there were people who believed that Jovenel Moïse was going to be arrested by the Americans and they were playing on this. And there was a power grab and everybody had either their, their choice for his replacement as president in their back pocket or they had their choice for prime minister to replace him. So this whole thing, basically, it's like a three-act Shakespearean. Uh, I, I was literally just going to say something similar to that. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And I should say that the former first lady um, and her lawyers, they have vehemently denied um, these allegations of her involvement. Um, one of the things the judge pointed out was some contradictions and statements that she had made um, in the media and in the few interviews that she's given. And then the only interview that she gave the Haitian authorities um, at the same time, um, Claude Joseph, the former prime minister, also has vehemently denied this. He says that the current prime minister is basically politicizing the justice system. And they're saying they had nothing to do with it. The former police chief, he was Haiti's representative to the OAS, Leon Charles, last week. After this, he resigned. He says he wants to be free to, you know, to fight these allegations. It's to be continued. I mean, we should say on the U.S. side of this investigation, there are 11 individuals who are currently in U.S. custody. Six of them have pleaded um, for the most part to participating in the kidnapping or killing um, of Haiti's president. They face life imprisonment. They're hoping to cut that down by cooperating with U.S. authorities. Um, one of them, one of the six is basically charged with smuggling ballistic vests um, into the country. The trial is scheduled for May. We're going to see if that happens. Interesting. Yeah. And we'll have to wait and see how this shakes out. Um, all right. I'll get you out of here on, on one last question. You know, there's been calls for international intervention. The UN has been involved. There's been proposals for a Kenyan led police mission. So, you know, what do you think, where, where do you, where are we on that right now? And, you know, do you have any sort of thoughts on what we should be watching for in the coming months? You, you asked a question earlier in terms of how everyday Haitians are getting by and I can tell you that it's a very difficult situation. I was in Haiti in December and I had been going back and forth to Haiti throughout this, but your, your nerves are just rattled because imagine you're in a car, you're on a road and whether there's a car in front of you or there's no one in front of you, you don't know when you're gonna get cut off and somebody's gonna jump out and you get grabbed or you become the next um, kidnapping victim or you become the next murder victim. I mean, 1,100 people were killed or injured or kidnapped just in January alone. It's one of the deadliest months in the last in the last two years. And so imagine as a parent, you're sending your child to school and even in the schools today, you cannot rest because we're seeing instances where children are being locked in schools for days because of the violence outside that they cannot leave. There are schools that have to shut down because of flying bullets that are going through there because of the gang infighting. Nothing is sacred. Hospitals have been shot up. And while the police, despite their many challenges, have been able to step in in some places. The problem is, is that their numbers are not there where they can hold on to a community once they grab it. I mean, imagine I, I went to Haiti last year, January, with a member of the administration because they wanted to look at this whole issue of policing and preparation 
for some country to come in and to bring in um, some armed intervention. And we literally stepped into a police riot because there are so many police officers who had been shot and killed by gang members just that month that the frustration just hit a boil. Every day is, is this difficult situation. And yes, um, a lot of Haitians, especially those who live in the diaspora, you know, they are not in favor of this idea of foreign boots coming onto the ground and to provide security. But it really is a numbers game, isn't it? You have a court system that is dysfunctional, that has been shut down, attacked, burned uh, by gang members. And so even when you make arrests, well, how do they even have due process? So what do you do? So there is a push to get Kenya. Kenya is the only country that raised their hands after almost a year. Um, that situation is facing a couple of hurdles right now. As you may have heard, um, the high court in Nairobi basically said that the deployment of a thousand Kenyan police officers is illegal. Um, they are trying to work through those legal challenges. At the same time, the U.S. just recently held a donors conference on the sidelines of a G20 ministerial meeting, trying to raise money for this force. Um, but we do not know when exactly we would see any sort of deployment. There has been other countries in the Caribbean, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and also Benin just says that they will give about 1,500 to 2,000 troops. Uh, this is supposed to be a police-led mission, and the idea is to send in police officers from outside to go in and to help the Haitian police combat these violent gangs. It's not to do the job of the Haitian police officers themselves, but to basically work with them. And so everybody's looking to see. I mean, you, you need to have an election. In order to have election, you need to have security. And in order to have security, you need to have a force that is able to provide that security. But it's not a perfect situation. And I know, you know, most Haitians would like to be able to do it by themselves. But when you talk to everyday regular Haitians who are having to live with the challenges of the gang violence, of the kidnappings, they're just desperate for any sort of help at this point. Yeah, I can only imagine. And you can understand the Haitians' reluctance as well. They've seen this movie before of, of multi, you know foreign interventions in the last 30 years, but here they are. Well, Jacqueline, I really appreciate you uh, breaking this situation down for us. You know, let's hope everybody keeps this on their radar because it is a horrible situation that needs to be rectified as soon as possible. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you again to Jacqueline for her time and thoughts. And thank you for listening to this episode of Headlines in History. This show is produced by Freddie Mallinson and Jarrett Dang. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Be sure to check out any episodes you may have missed via our website. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else they listen. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu, to learn more about our work. I'm Kelly McFarland. Until we meet again.